All right, thank you for coming to this session. Uh, our speaker today is Holly Roof. Roof, all right, an award-winning researcher, lecturer, and data visualization expert, and analytics consultant, adjunct in the Department of Business Information and Analytics at the University of Denver. She wields a PhD in research methods and statistics, combined with master's degrees in business and education, to slice through a wide range of research topics and variety of data. And she rides horses. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Holly Roof. <laughs> Holly, uh, and I'm here to talk about Versage. So, anybody know about Versage? Seen it? Seen it? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the plan is we'll talk about Versage first, a little vocabulary, stuff like that, and then we just do my research, the data, and what I found, and then my own personal spin on the whole thing. So, what is Versage? Versage is an equestrian sport. It has its roots way back in antiquity and the training of cavalry horses. And so coming up through the First World War where cavalry horses were still a thing, and then Versage moved into the Olympics as a sport in the very first Olympics and is still being competed at the Olympics today. Um, so dressage is considered to be the highest expression of training in a horse. The word means training in French. So uh, it's considered to be the most artistic of equestrian sports. And the competition is similar to figure skating and gymnastics. We probably we've all seen that in the Olympics, watching those competitions. Uh, there's a prescribed set of movements that the horse and rider team has to go through and then each of those movements are judged by a team of judges. Uh, horses have three gates, walk, trot, canter, and in a um, test is what it's called, so they would ride a test, and the test has precise beginning and ending points around the arena. You know, so they have to go to A and they have to do a circle or something, which totally minimizes what they're doing. Dressage is unique among um, equestrian sports in that it is wholly judged. So these three pictures represent the three um, equestrian sports that are in the Olympics. So dressage is this person here. In the middle we have an eventer. And then over on the right is a show jumper. Eventing and show jumping, horses can crash into things and lose points, and there's times, and so there's quantifiable metrics by which those two events are scored, and dressage is different from those in that it is wholly judged. Equestrian sports in general are unique because male and female competitors compete against each other. So there's no segregation of the sexes. We don't have male horseback riding and then female horseback riding in the same way we have men's tennis and women's tennis or something like that. So dressage is scored by the judges watching the movements as the test is written. A movement that's not performed is given a zero and then a perfect score would be a 10. The judges also score the quality of the horse's gaits, it's how well it moves, the horse's cooperation and its energy, the rider's performance. Once all of that is done, the scores are converted to a percentage of the total points available. So each test has got a different summation of total points. And so the ultimate score is a percentage. There are certain movements within a test that are deemed more difficult than others, and those have got multiple coefficients as well. And so then if there are multiple judges, the score is averaged. So depending on the type of show or competition, uh, there would be from one up to five judges. Scored down to one one hundredth of a percent. And so it's a pretty minute number that would determine who wins and who doesn't win. So why the scores are important in dressage? As in all things, it comes down to money. So 
scores qualify a competitor for regional championships and achievement awards, that you know, the kind of thing that all of us might do if we were involved in the sport. If a competitor wants to be on a national team, say the Olympics, then the scores would qualify the competitor for that national team membership. Scores lead to prestige of the rider and or the horse's trainer, as well as the horse. Horses sell, some of them good ones, sell for over $100,000. So um, having a good horse, it's like racehorses. You got a good racehorse, you can make a lot of money with your racehorse. It's the same with dressage. World rankings of riders and horses are important to some people. This stuff is actually kept track of. And then for uh, people who are earning their living off of this, performance horses lead to sponsorships and uh, clients for people who are trying to earn money. There's way more females that participate than males. And I say females versus male because my data set has children as well. So um, I, I looked at children as well as adults in the data set. So I had female children and male children. This is the team competition at the Rio Olympics. And if you count, there are eight women and four men there. So even at this level, we see more uh, females competing than we see males. So I had some questions, <laughs> right? So where the first question came from, um, I was at a dressage competition, a regional championship with, uh, I just happened to be in the group with the defending champion. And she was a two-time defending champion at the highest level at this particular competition. And at this particular event, she came in second place. And when we got back to the barn, there were people in the group going, I think sometimes they just score men higher because they're men. Seriously, that was the attitude. OK, I have the skills. I can actually answer this question. So that was my first. The first question here is what things go in to determining an uh, athlete's score besides just their performance. And I'll go through all of these things as we go um, as far as what my predictors are. The second question here, uh, way to put a definition in, huh? N-A-J-Y-R-C, that's uh -huh. North American Junior Young Rider Championship. My daughter qualified for that, so it's an international competition that is available, or I guess available is the right word, to any North American competitors. We always said it was the Junior Olympics because that was easier than explaining what it really was. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and when we did that, there are several different routes by which a competitor can qualify for that. Um, Whoops. Where did I go? So one is the open show, they're not mutually exclusive, but the open show route. And so some people would call those local shows or your backyard shows or things like that. They're still recognized by the Federation as a show, uh, but typically they're more local, they're easier. We'll talk about that some more too. And then compared to CDI, so CDI is French for International Dressage Competition. And so there's different rules that set those up. And so there were some of these people that qualified who were grousing that, you know, well, my friend, she does the CDIs, and the CDIs are harder to get good scores at. So these people were arguing that there should be a handicapping system so that the competitors that went the CDI route could go with lower scores. That's research question number two. Um, and then based on other people's research, do judges have more difficulty evaluating performances at the upper extreme? Because in you know, the lower extreme, nobody really cares, right? A horse jumped out of the arena or something at the lowest, lower extreme. Um, so, is there more variability at the upper extreme, and then do judges favor their own 
countrymen, as it were. So those were all the questions that I was looking at. And I hope my results prevent, present new findings to improve judging and competition. All right, so then my data. Uh, there's this website that I can put up there. Um, Fox Village Dressage Software is the name of the website. You can Google it if you're interested in all the scores and all the shows and all over the place. Uh, so I get used an entire calendar year of, um, of these recognized shows in California and in Florida. The reason I chose California and Florida is that there's a circuit of the CDIs. So in order to get the sample size of the international shows, I went there. It was pretty onerous to collect the data. So I tried to limit it as much as possible. I looked at independent variables of sex, the state that the show was held in, the show type. So that's whether it's an international show, the CDIs, or the open shows. And then division. So someone enters the open division. Typically, those are professional riders that would be there. Adult, amateurs, that's obvious. And junior and young riders, there, there are tests that are age limited. So a junior rider is under 18 and a young rider is typically under 21 years old. And then I looked at the tests that they rode, the judge and the rider nationality. I looked at the number of judges and horse breed. This is my most boring slide, I promise. Um, so there were some things that I had a little trouble with out of my data set. So for instance, gender or sex was not reported for all of the writers. So you know, since that was kind of one of my main questions, what do I do about it? So what I did about it was that if it was a common name, common in my experience name, so Someone named Kathy was assigned to be a female. Someone named David was assigned to be a male. If it was a name that I wasn't familiar with, as far as you know, being able to automatically assign gender to it, or some sort of an unusual name, I, I used Facebook. I would, <laughs> so I would do an internet search. You know, a lot of professional writers have got websites. I would look on Facebook. It's not a real huge community, so I I found all but 35 writers out of thousands <laughs> by looking at Facebook and finding somebody with a horse and oh look, that person's a friend with one of my friends. And, right. So if I had a match on the name, I assumed that that is was the person. Okay, horses. I did look at horse breed, and horse breed was not universally um, denoted in the scores. And so I went to a different database there. USDF is the United States Dressage Federation. And so I looked through their registered horse database trying to find the breed. All of the variables, that would be all of the independent variables, were categorical. So male, female the test that the individual rode, uh, the nation that the individual was from, that sort of thing. So I spent weeks coding, creating cat, uh, binary codes for everything, right? Um, number of judges, like I said, it's usually one through five judges, but that was not normally distributed because it's when you get to five judges, that's like the Olympics and things like that, but there would be five judges. But the typical show that we're going to go to down the road is only going to have one because judges cost money. So it wasn't normally distributed in any way, and so therefore I treated it as categorical with the categories of one, two, three, and five judges. Um, I used score as the dependent variable. I did a regression, and then the initial set of predict predictors were sex, state, the type of show it was, uh, the type of division. You know, I'll talk about big tour, small tour here in a second. Uh, I used SPSS. I evaluated statistical significance at 0 0.05. I had no missing values. 
Okay, so in Versace, I've talked a little bit about how there are open shows and then there are the CDIs. So an open show has got a national governance, the United States Versace Federation. And those shows have all levels, starting from beginner levels. So beginners are either or both the horse or the rider. So in either case, whoever they enter, what level they feel is appropriate and work up the levels. So when we get to the international level, then we only have advanced tests. At an open show, you can ride those same advanced tests. So I only pulled the advanced test scores. Open shows, as I said, you've got just one or two judges. You also have divisions, so the professionals can compete separately from the amateurs. In the international shows, everybody's in the same doesn't matter if you're an amateur or a professional or a kid or whatever, you're all competing together. So those are the big differences. So now these are the tests, the actual ones um, that the horses would ride highest. It's not a very steady hand. So this is the hardest, working down to the easiest. None of them are easy, they're all advanced tests. In the international competitions, they are competed together as a group. So someone would enter to compete the big tour or the small tour. And then for the juniors and the young riders, there are a variety of tests, including the same big tour, small tour tests, but they are limited to under 18 or under 21, or there's even some that are under 25. And so I lumped all those together. All right. My sample, I had a total of whatever these two numbers add up to. These are the females and these are the males. 85%, 14% of my scores. Um, that is what it is. Remember I said that women or females are much more representative. So, to answer question number one, I did a regression. I created four different models. I did, this first model was the complete data set of all the scores that I collected. The second model, I took the outliers out. I did outliers at three standard deviations. So I didn't pull a whole bunch out of there. But on the upper end, uh, outlier scores were going to Olympians and world-class athletes. And then because of this unbalanced sample size between the males and the females, I did two more models where I took a random sample of female scores so that I had the same number of female scores as I had male scores. And then I did the same thing with the complete data set and pulling out that top and bottom of the three standard deviations. Um, this is another boring slide. So I came up with four models, and um, I have my number of the sample size here. Whoop, wrong button. <coughs> the average scores, you can see that they're pretty close to the same thing. Standard deviations are pretty close to the same thing. Minimum scores, somebody getting down in these scores, this is a horse that reared, or the horse jumped out of the arena, or somebody totally of course, you know, stupid stuff that happens. Uh, and then those maximum scores, like those are still Olympian type scores up there. And then we have the number of athletes and the number of shows that are represented there. Okay, so for research number one, research question number one, what combination of variables can be used to predict final scores? So all of the models that I created came up with basically the same four, that the sex of the athlete can predict scores, whether it's the international versus the open show predicts scores, um, and then the division. So open division, adult, amateur, and because they're binary, then the junior is in there, even though it doesn't quite appear here. I have a bunch of boring slides, so these are the equations. 
Um, so you can see in the equations that we're pretty much the same, pretty close to the same with the intercept. And then I've got these coefficients. So each one of the different models, I'm going to talk mostly about model number four, simply because here are my r squared, so the amount of variation explained by each model is what r squared is explaining. And so model number four, that's the one where I randomized the female participants and took out the outliers. That one is explaining 17% of the variation in score. We would like to think that 100% of the variation in score is attributable to the athlete's performance, but we have 17% attributed to other things. And then you can see as we go down to the full data set, uh, this one is also important to, in my opinion, because they are actual scores earned by actual athletes, even if um, I did take the outliers out of the other one. Okay, so now this next set of graphs here, this is based on that model four, which had the highest R squared. So these are what my coefficients represent. The average score for all riders, in this case we're looking at the division in which they competed. So adult, amateur, open, and the juniors, young rider. The average score is 63.5. A person who is competing in the open division would be expected to earn a 64.4, and an adult amateur would be expected to earn a 61.3. Okay. Not too surprising, I wouldn't think. I wasn't too surprised. We would expect the professionals to get a higher score than the amateurs. All right? If not, maybe they need to get a different job. Um, <laughs> kind of surprised that the juniors are right there in the middle. But anyways, that's what the data tells us. Then we have the shows, the show type. So the international show versus the open show. I was a little bit surprised to see that the international shows was as much higher as it is, but then when I thought about it, I decided I wasn't surprised because the international shows are more expensive. For one, they're more expensive for a lot of reasons. Yeah, I mean seriously, because for one thing, they're four-day shows, and if you've ever traveled with a horse, it's not a cheap proposition in any sort of anybody's imagination. So there's four days that you've got to stable this horse. There's four days that you've got to have people that are taking care of the horse. Because it's an international show, you have to have a passport, an actual passport for a horse. <laughs> yeah, that's like 300 bucks. Um, because of the level of competition, there's a mandatory veterinary inspection. There is drug testing for the horse and for the rider, there's 24 hour security. So all of these things then contribute to the international show being far more expensive. The open show, like I said, you know, some people call these your local shows or your neighborhood shows. If I live close enough, I can just haul my horse on down there for the day and we can do our thing going ball. So the fact that the CDIs are more expensive and the fact that the CDIs are the route to world ranking and the route to national level teams, the CDIs attract a different caliber of rider, let's say. All right, the CDIs are gonna attract the professional riders that want to go to the Olympics, that sort of thing. So when you look at it in that light, this result is not all that surprising either. This one, however. This is the one that really surprised me. When you think that only 15% of my sample was male. And males are predicted in this model to score 1.25 points higher. When the competition is scored at 1 1,000th of a percentage point. Predicting that males are going to get that much higher of a score I was surprised. Let's put it that way. I was surprised. The other models have it up to 1.52 points 
so percentage points higher for a male over a female. Another, this one is actually in that question too, is the horse's breed and the regression model. Uh, I couldn't do it that way. I couldn't put it in the model because I had a high level of missingness in the horse's breed. Uh, and so, what I did here. Warm blood, this horse represents a warm blood. Warm blood is a class of horse. What they're typically used in dressage, and the question is then does this class of horse get a higher score? I went and looked up as best as I could the horse breed. What I had to do for that was to go to the USDF record and search for the horse's name. If I found the horse's name, the horse's name is listed with the horse's owner, but the horse's owner is not necessarily the person who rides the horse. So I was able, if I could match the owner and the name and the record for the test, then I decided that I had the right thing. But if I couldn't match the horse to the name, then I didn't know if I had the right horse or not. Therefore, because professional riders are on other people's horses, and amateur riders are on their own horses, and junior riders, they might be on their mom's horse, so if it was the same last name, I would count that. But it's not ignorable that I had this high degree of missingness in my sample. Okay. I will take it. So, in that sample, horse breed does not make a difference. Research question number two, I looked at juniors and young riders to see if one route over the other was an easier way to go. Independent t-test is not significant, therefore no is the answer to that. It doesn't matter which way you go. Research question number three, do judges have more difficulty evaluating at the upper extreme? Previous research looked at this from the quartiles and concluded that in the upper and lower quartile there was a higher standard deviation. I looked at it from standard deviations above three and above two and as you can see comparing above three I have less variance. So I'm disagreeing with that previous research. Research number four, question number four, judges favoring their own country. I had a bazillion little countries. I had Macedonia as a judge and a bunch of things like that, so I couldn't totally pair country to, to writer. And so I collapsed all of it into the same or different nationality. And the answer to that question is also no. That is not statistically significant. Oops. And then we don't need bias, except that's how I'm framing this answer. <laughs> Correlation is not causation, but um, my idea is that we have implicit bias in the judging, which is leading to the conclusion that males, we all think this, right? Males are better athletes. Males are bigger, stronger. We think of them as athletes. Um, so that would be the next direction of research, I think, is seeing if there is a way to identify if truly it's implicit bias. I'm not saying that there's a judge out there that's saying, oh, male, give them a big, you know, a better score. I don't think that's happening at all. But I think that uh, there is an unconscious expectation that males um, score higher. And then the Grand Prix test, this is where uh, I think it comes from. In the Grand Prix test, which happens in five minutes and 45 seconds, the judge has got to come up with 33 different scores for 54 different movements, which leads to 6.4 seconds per movement. And then there's another moment or two in which the writer assigns the collective marks for submission, um, harmony, those things. So. If I could get my hands on those marks, the right, the, the breakdown of the scores, 
I suspect that I would find a difference in the collective marks more than the um, individual marks. Thanks, Holly.